Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I am Andrea Gartner. I am Global Product Manager for Prenatal Screening Portfolio at Thermo Fisher Scientific. It is a pleasure to welcome you today to this webinar on behalf of Thermo Fisher Scientific. And before I introduce our speaker, I will give you some housekeeping information. Okay, so what you see here on the screen is the main console. The current speaker is always displayed in the media player window. There are multiple application enga uh, engagement tools you can use at the bottom of your screen. All the engagement tools are resizable and movable, so you can click on the, si on the slide area to view the current slide. After the main presentation, we will have a Q&A session where you are invited to ask questions. You can ask questions at any time during the webinar by written via the Q&A tool. Just type the question and submit. At the end of the presentation, we will address the questions to the speaker. To connect to the Spanish translation, please follow the instructions in the translation widget. Okay, just some general recommendations for you. For the best viewing experience, we recommend a wired internet connection and closing any browser you may have running at the moment. You can find additional answers to some common technical issues located in the Help Engagement tool at the bottom of your screen. The agenda for today will include one main talk followed by the Q&A session. So I will now introduce our speaker. It is my honor today to introduce and welcome Professor Nicolaitis to this webinar. I am quite sure Professor doesn't need much presentations as he's very well known, Professor in the field of fetal medicine. Nevertheless, I must say some words. Professor Nicolaitis is the founder and chairman of the Fetal Medicine Foundation, which he set up in 1995. This is a charity organization that promotes the research and training in fetal medicine around the world and has already donated 45 million pounds for this purpose. Professor Nicolaides has authored over 1,500 peer-reviewed journal articles and more than 30 books. His research has been cited over 135,000 times. He has provided training in fetal medicine to over 1,000 doctors and over 50 countries. So thank you, Professor for accepting our invite to be here today. And I now give you the stage to talk about prediction and prevention of term preeclampsia. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea and uh, Thermo Fisher for organizing this, uh, this meeting. I have uh, spent uh, many years uh, discussing and researching the prediction and prevention of uh, preterm preeclampsia, and our focus now has turned to that of term preeclampsia. But to give you a perspective, I have to go back to discussing what is the consequence of preeclampsia on a worldwide basis. Although the condition affects only about 4% of pregnancies, it is responsible for more than 45,000 maternal deaths every year somewhere in the world, and more than half a million fetal and neonatal deaths. And it is because of these major adverse consequences that it is one of the leading causes of death and handicap in obstetrics. And both women and babies that survive from the pregnancy complicated by preeclampsia face a long-term increased cardiovascular risk with consequent death in years to come as a result of um, 
strokes and heart attacks. So it is a condition to be taken very seriously and to be followed up, even postnatally. Now, when I was a student, life was relatively simple in terms of the definition of preeclampsia, because it was the combination of high blood pressure and proteinuria appearing for the first time in the second half of pregnancy. But more recently, people have realized that you can have increased maternal and perinatal mortality if you have hypertension in the absence of proteinuria, but in the presence of other and organ dysfunction. And what do I mean by that? If you have hypertension without proteinuria, but you have headaches that persist despite treatment, pulmonary edema, eclampsia, altered mental status, blindness, stroke, and clonus. If you have hematological consequences with a low platelet count, renal, high creatinine, hepatic, high liver enzymes. And essentially at the moment, there are small differences between the two leading proponents of this shift away from proteinuria to other evidence of dysfunction, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the International Society for the Study of Hypertension in Pregnancy. For example, in American College, you are considered to be uh, evidence of hematological dysfunction if the platelet count is less than 100, whereas in the International Society, if the platelet count is less than 150. Also, recently, in the International Society definition, they include evidence of uteroplacental dysfunction. So if you have high blood pressure and fetal death, you have a retrospective diagnosis of preeclampsia. Or if you have fetal growth restriction, at the time when you diagnose the high blood pressure. And what is fetal growth restriction? It is an estimated fetal weight below the third percentile, or an estimated fetal weight between the third and the tenth percentile, together with high uterine artery pulsatility index, high umbilical artery pulsatility index, and low middle cerebral artery possibility index. More recently, preeclampsia has been expanded to include hypertension with abnormal angiogenic markers at the time of screening. And what do I mean by that? High fleet one above the 95th percentile of the normal range or and low placental growth factor below the fifth percentile. So this is a continuously shifting definition where cases that were traditionally classified as gestational hypertension are now considered to be preeclampsia. And therefore, the incidence of the condition is increasing. Now, let me summarize what we learned in the last few decades in relation to the prediction of uh, preeclampsia, preterm preeclampsia. The traditional approach towards the prediction of any type of preeclampsia is based on this risk scoring system. The NICE guidelines in England, the American College of Pediatrics and Gynecologists in the United States, consider you to be at high risk of developing preeclampsia if you have had a previous pregnancy complicated by preeclampsia, if you start off your pregnancy with uh, renal disease or chronic hypertension 
or uh, diabetes or autoimmune disease, lupus or antiphospholipid syndrome. If the answer to any one of these top questions is negative, then you ask a further five questions, and then you are considered to be at high risk if you are positive to two of them. If this is your first pregnancy and you are over the age of 40 in England or over the age of 35 in the United States, you have a body mass index of more than 35 in England, more than 30 in the United States, there is a long interval between this and your previous pregnancy of more than 10 years, and in the United States, if you're black or poor, and quite often the two coincide. So, so this is a, a simple way of identifying a high-risk group for both preterm and term uh, preeclampsia, but it is not a very good method. It classifies in general about 10% of the population as being at high risk. And this group of 10% contains only about 40% of the women that will develop preeclampsia. So it misses 60% of the disease or more. We have spent a few years trying to develop a new method. And that new method is um, that which combines the information between maternal risk factors, like increasing maternal age, increasing maternal weight, uh, black and South Asian uh, race, previous preeclampsia, the mother had preeclampsia, conception by in vitro fertilization, a history of chronic hypertension, diabetes, and autoimmune disease. And that gives you the prior risk, the starting risk. And then at the time of the 12-week routine ultrasound examination in pregnancy, we measure with Doppler the uterine artery pulsatility index as a measure of the perfusion by the mother of the placenta and the baby, the mean arterial pressure, and the measurement of placental growth factor. This is what I call the triple test. History plus three things. And with this approach, we identify now 90% of the women that will develop very early preeclampsia, requiring delivery before 32 weeks. About 75% of those with preterm preeclampsia, but only 40% of those with term preeclampsia. So first trimester screening is very good for the most severe type of early preeclampsia, but not so good for the detection of term preeclampsia. We then carried out a major study, now widely known as the ASPRE project, where we used the Fetal Medicine Foundation method of the triple test to screen 27,000 women. And we identified the high-risk group. We randomized them into aspirin, 150 milligrams per day from 12 to 36 weeks, versus placebo. And we found that in the group that received aspirin, we reduced the rate of very early preeclampsia by about 90% preterm preeclampsia overall by a little bit more than 60%, but there was no impact from this strategy on the incidence of term preeclampsia. So this is where we are. What about now term preeclampsia? Everybody can consider that if you deliver preeclampsia at 27, 28 weeks, that is a very serious condition that could lead to the death of the baby or the mother. But if you deliver preeclampsia, if you develop preeclampsia at 40 weeks, doesn't really matter very much. You can argue, you just deliver 
the pregnancy and both the mother and the baby survive. So term preeclampsia is not such a serious problem. But is that true? This is a study that we carried out involving 40,000 women that we screened at 12 weeks, and then we followed the pregnancy graph. And then we are looking at the incidence of adverse outcome. And you can see here in blue histograms, preterm preeclampsia, the incidence of severe hypertension for the mother, maternal mortality and morbidity, perinatal mortality and morbidity, neonatal unit admission for more than 48 hours, and the low birth weight below the third centile, the incidence of each one of these adverse events was considerably higher in the preterm blue rather than the term preeclampsia. But that is only half of the story. Why? Because the incidence of preterm preeclampsia is 0.6, 0.7%, whereas that of term preeclampsia is 2.5 to 3%. Therefore, term preeclampsia is much more common, and therefore the overall contribution of term preeclampsia to adverse outcomes is considerable. For example, 75, 74% of the total number of cases of severe hypertension more than half of the total cases of maternal death and severe morbidity arise from women that develop term rather than preterm preeclampsia. And also a very high proportion of adverse perinatal outcome for the baby arises from the group that developed preeclampsia at term. So, Yes, preeclampsia before term has a higher incidence of complications, but the contribution of all of the major uh, adverse events for the mother and the baby are substantially arising from the group that developed a preeclampsia at term. So preeclampsia at term is not something to be dismissed. It is something that is very serious. Now, let me summarize our research in relation to preterm preeclampsia. In the first trimester screening, we detect few of the cases of term preeclampsia, and in treatment with aspirin, we have no effect on term preeclampsia. So first trimester screening is not good enough, and aspirin treatment in the prevention of term Preeclampsia. So what can we do for that group? This is now what I was originally asked to discuss. Prediction of term preeclampsia. <clears throat> we have carried out an, an original study more than uh, six years ago, this Andreati study involving nearly 4,000 singleton pregnancies that we routinely examine at 35 to 36 uh, at seven weeks. And that is given by the blue lines on the right. And you can see the performance of screening by maternal risk factors alone with the addition of various biomarkers, mean arterial pressure, uterine artery pulsatility index, placental growth factor, and fleet, and then combinations of biomarkers. And the best prediction in the third trimester is achieved by a combination of maternal risk factors together with mean arterial pressure, placental growth factor, and fleet where we have a detection rate of 79%, 79%. The addition of uterine artery Doppler does not improve the prediction. That is what we showed in the development of a model. 
And more recently, we used a prospective study in which we had the support from uh, Thermo Fisher using the crypto machine where we measured PLGF and Fleet One at 35 to 37 weeks. And we showed that in this nearly large sample of 30,000 pregnancies at this gestation, the performance of screening, the red lines, was very similar to what we had predicted from the original method of screening. So, summary, the best way of predicting term preeclampsia is to screen near the disease by routine assessment at 36 weeks by a combination of history, placental growth factor, mean arterial pressure, and fleet one. In many countries, a routine ultrasound scan is carried out at three stages in pregnancy, at 12 weeks, 20 weeks, and at some time in the third trimester. Traditionally, the third trimester scan was carried out at 32 weeks, but we have shown in the last few years that it is better to move the third trimester scan to 36 weeks, because with this change in gestation, we can predict more effectively the complications of preeclampsia and small for gestational age and stillbirth at term by doing the scan at 36 rather than at 32 weeks. And it is at the back of this routine ultrasound examination at 36 weeks that I believe we should be introducing the measurement of blood pressure and angiogenic factors, not only for the prediction of term preeclampsia, but also increasing evidence that that would be useful for the prediction of stillbirth and assessment of small for gestational age babies. And these um, rock curves show the results of a prospective study, again, involving 15,000 uh, pregnancies, where we compared the value of the PLGF concentration, the fleet to PLGF concentration ratio, and our model, which combines maternal characteristics with the measurements of biomarkers, including mean arterial pressure. The last few years, there has been a push towards the use of PLGF, mainly in England, low PLGF in the assessment of pregnancies presenting with possible preeclampsia for the characterization of those pregnancies as to whether they were very likely to deliver with preeclampsia in the next one or two or three weeks. And in many European uh, countries, with the use of the fleet to PLGF ratio alone. The use of these biomarkers alone in a simple cutoff is useful because it is easy to do, and anybody can respond to a command. If the value is below this level or above that level, you should do this. However, I find that irrational. In what way? A woman presents with different types of history. We know that if you have chronic hypertension, we know that if you're black, we know that if you are of advanced age or of high weight, your chances, your prior risk is much higher of actually developing preeclampsia than not. And then we want also, I find it illogical that in the assessment of pregnancies as to whether they will develop preeclampsia or not, we do not include the measurement of blood pressure. It is therefore more rational for me to combine the information of the biomarkers together with the information of who the woman is 
and what is her blood pressure in the prediction of what is going to happen in the subsequent one or two or three weeks. And this is what we see in these rock curves. The black line shows the value of the raw data of PLGF, the blue of the raw data of the free to PLGF concentration ratio, and then the red is the combination of maternal characteristics with the values of the biomarkers adjusted for maternal characteristics. What do I mean by that? For many, many years, we have known in biochemical testing that the value of anything we measure in the mother's blood depends on the gestational age. It depends on how big or small the woman is. We know in screening for Down syndrome, for example, that the values of PAB or HCG that come out of the machine need to be adjusted for the gestational age, for the weight of the woman, for the race of the woman, and the method of conception and so on, and convert the raw data into multiples of the media adjusted for maternal characteristics so that the values are comparable. And I feel that exactly the same thing should be happening in relation to uh, assessment of risk for preeclampsia using uh, biomarkers. And yes, it is easier to respond to one ratio, but you know, in the year 2022, people know that you can use computers and computers can easily calculate um, the risk for an individual patient. I want to illustrate the point, for example, on race. And this is from a study involving 29,000 singleton pregnancies that we assessed at the 36th week of pregnancy. We know that in black women that do not develop preeclampsia, PLGF is much higher by 60% than in white women. We know that if you're going to develop preeclampsia or the baby's going to be small or the baby's going to die, PLGF decreases. But if you are a black woman and you start off with a much higher level of PLGF and your level has now decreased so that your risk is increased, it has decreased to a level that is the same or still higher than a non preeclamptic white woman. And therefore, if you are in a predominantly white society, failure to adjust for race is biased against black people. And you can illustrate that with the uh, curves that we show here. In the no preeclampsia group in white women, you can see the, 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 the Gaussian distribution. And then in women that will develop preeclampsia, the levels shift to the left. And if we take a cutoff, uh, as shown by a vertical black line, in the women that will develop preeclampsia, the 45% will have a value below the given cutoff. In black women, because they normally start off with a much higher level of PLGF, a decrease and the shift to the left will identify a lower number of black women that will develop preeclampsia. So we have a bias against women that have the highest risk of preeclampsia that arise from the black race. How do we correct for this uh, bias? Well, very simple, really. We calculate the mom values rather than simple picograms per ml values. And when we convert the values into moms, adjusting for age and weight and race, then the mom values in black and white women are the same because you have adjusted for race. And therefore, in women that will develop preeclampsia, the mom values have equally reduced. 
Let me now go to the last part of my lecture, and that is on the prevention of term preeclampsia. A study in the United States, a very small pilot study, had shown that if we give two women at high risk of preeclampsia 10 milligrams of pravastatin every day, by comparison with placebo, this was a very small study of 20 women, 10 in each arm. In the placebo group, four out of the 10 women developed preeclampsia, and in the group that received pravastatin, there were no cases of preeclampsia. So that was a very, very promising uh, study. And therefore, we wondered whether we can use pravastatin in our group identified at 36 weeks as being at high risk for preeclampsia. We carried a study nearly of 30,000 women across several European countries using our method of history and the triple test, mean arterial pressure, placenta growth factor, and fleet at 36 weeks. We identified the high risk group for preeclampsia and we randomized the women into Prava study. 20 milligrams every day against placebo, and unfortunately we showed that there was no impact whatsoever. It is possible that the amount of pravastatin we used was not enough, or that we left it for too late. But either way, we could not reduce the rate of preeclampsia. So what are we left with, really? We also found in that study that Pravastadin, the red dots against the placebo, the black dots, had no impact on the level of PLGF or FLIT. So pravastadin was not a useful method of preventing uh, the abnormal angiogenic factors or preeclampsia alone. So what can we do now? Well, we are proposing this concept of personalized timing of birth at term. And what is that? A study from the United States by Grobman has taken 6,000 women or so that were naliparous in their first pregnancy, and they randomized them into two groups. In one group, they induced labor or carried out cesarean sections during the 39th week and in the other group, they allowed the women to carry on with pregnancy. And they found that this intervention of delivering at 39 weeks versus expectant management had no impact on perinatal death or severe neonatal complications. It reduced, contrary to all expectation, the rate of cesarean section People would have thought that by inducing labor early, you would increase the rate of cesarean section. Well, the study showed a reduction, a significant reduction in the rate of cesarean section. And more importantly, as a secondary outcome of that study was hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, where there was a dramatic reduction from 14 to 9% in the incidence of preeclampsia and gestational hypertension. And this makes sense. If you deliver a woman the day before she's due to develop preeclampsia, by definition, you are preventing the development of preeclampsia. Based on this finding, people have now started advancing the argument that in women that do develop preeclampsia, near or at term, it is better, even if it's mild disease, to deliver them immediately rather than wait for the pregnancy to get worse. And the real question is that, can we do the same by identifying the high-risk group of women and delivering them before they develop preeclampsia? And the question is, how do we identify this high-risk group? In the blue panel on the top is the approach of using the NICE guidelines, the history-based method, and then the triple test PLGF or PAVE plus mean arterial pressure plus uterine artery plus the index the first trimester by comparison with screening at 35 to 36 weeks. Because the closer you are to the disease, the higher the detection rate, 
it is obvious that the screening at 36 weeks is more effective at identifying the high risk group. And therefore, if we were to deliver women based on their risk, at let's say at 37 or 38 or 39 or 40 weeks, we will be reducing the rate of preeclampsia by varying proportions. There is a problem, however, with delivering everybody at 37 weeks. If we look at the bottom panel, by delivering women at 37 weeks that are at high risk, we will end up delivering about 10% of the population at 37 weeks in order to reduce the rate of term preeclampsia by 60%. And to me, that is too much of a risk to take because if you deliver 10% of the women at 37 weeks, it is possible that you will increase neonatal morbidity. A more rational approach is to stratify the risk and based on the risk, then to time the delivery. If your risk is extremely high, one in two, in that group, we will have preeclampsia, we'll have gestational hypertension, you'll have stillbirths, we'll have severely small for gestational age babies. So a very high proportion of those pregnancies are at risk of one or another pregnancy complication. And it is therefore reasonable for this 1% of the women to be delivered at 37 weeks. And then as the risk becomes less and less, we increase the proportion of women that have delivery, planned delivery at 38, 39, 40 weeks, and 41 weeks. And it is this stratification of risk in timing of delivery that is now part of the research project that we are carrying out. And in this respect, we are grateful to Thermo Fisher for supporting uh, this uh, study by providing uh, re reagents and equipment for free. I believe that we will be able to answer this question uh, by uh, one year and therefore have a, a major impact on a reduction in the rate of term preeclampsia. So I thank you very much for your attention and I will be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Professor. As usual, very clear. So I have some questions I would like to ask. I will start with some question, some practical questions about implementation of screening. Do you see any hard hurdles um, that can come from delivery of at each week based on risk? Which are the hurdles that you see that can come like multiples? cutoffs, adaptation of risk to software tool calculation, um, for risk calculation, what do you see can be the hurdles? Okay. Thank you. I think if we were asked this question a few years ago, I would have thought that it would be very, very difficult. But nowadays, we have the example of first trimester screening for Down syndrome. And in many of our countries, at least developing and developed countries, there is routine first trimester screening. Women go to a clinic at around 12 weeks. They have an ultrasound scan. They are asked questions about their characteristics and their previous medical history, and the blood sample is taken. There are automated machines that measure uh, free beta HCG and PAVE uh, within 40 minutes of a visit. There are software widely available, where you combine the information about how old is the woman together with the measurement of nuclear translucency and the biochemistry, you have a calculation of risk. And in different countries, you have a risk cutoff that defines the next step. The traditional approach, if your risk was more than one in 100 in some countries, more than one in 300, in other countries, you were offered to have a chorionic villus sampling. More recently, in many countries, there has been an inclusion of self-DNA testing from maternal blood if your risk is one in 500 or one in 1,000 or one in 2,000. So the concept that you combine in one hospital visit information from the history, information from the scan, 
and information from the biochemistry to calculate the risk, and then you respond to that risk by the next steps is well established now for more than 20 years. So I don't think it would be very difficult to adapt that approach to the third trimester. An extremely important component, of course, of screening is quality control. And in England, for example, every laboratory, every few months, has to present to a central mathematical group their results to adjust the multiples of the media, whether these are for uh, free beta HCG or PABE, or the measurement of nuclear translucency. So the infrastructure for achieving screening and software and calculation of risk is there. The next question is that would women respond as we would like them to, to their risk? I think most of them will, and some will never respond and will never accept any recommendation. But that's fine. Um, I think in a society we need to accept and be tolerant to different views of different people. But the vast majority of women that are told that you have an extremely high risk in the next few days, you will develop preeclampsia. And in the middle of the night, you may end up having uh, to have a sudden increase in your blood pressure that can produce an abruption that can cause the death of your baby, or uh, you will need an emergency delivery. And it is better to deliver you in a planned way in advance of that event. I think the vast majority of women will be rational enough to accept that uh, process. And then we are left with the next step. Will the obstetric and midwifery community respond to that risk? In England, we are under enormous economic problems, especially at the moment, and there is a deficiency of doctors and midwives. The whole system is under enormous strain. Would they be able to respond? I think that people need to be trained and they need to understand that perhaps if our trial shows that it is beneficial for the women, it is beneficial for their babies, then the system has to respond to this request. Okay. That already answered one of the questions I had about the impact of planned early delivery. So how would you convince a woman um, that has no symptoms, that feels well, how to how would you convince her? But that is answered. So I have here some questions from the audience. One of them is, do we know whether preventing preeclampsia term and preterm also lowers the risk of long-term cardiovascular health risk for women? Very good question. I don't know. And I don't think that anybody would be able to rationally answer that question, except for one thing. In the case of renal damage, if you have the development of severe hypertension, a severe hypertensive event, that would have a, an adverse effect on renal uh, function. So, and then of course, renal function goes with chronic renal failure. And then of course, that already predisposes you to long-term cardiovascular risk. In terms of, in the absence of renal failure, is there an effect of preeclampsia on increasing your long-term cardiovascular risk? I don't think that people can answer that question. And personally, I believe no. I believe that the most likely uh, explanation for the association between preeclampsia and long-term cardiovascular risk is that you have an existing, pre-existing uh, cardiovascular uh, morbidity. Extensive research now by our groups and others are showing that in women that develop preeclampsia, but also in those before the development of preeclampsia, you have abnormal blood flow in the ophthalmic artery, you have increased uh, peripheral resistance, and I strongly suspect that there are a group of women that have increased peripheral resistance because of chronic vascular disease uh, before they get pregnant, during pregnancy, that predisposes them to preeclampsia, and that continues beyond uh, pregnancy. I am not 
convinced that it is preeclampsia that produces the vascular disease that will predispose you to long-term cardiovascular complications. Thank you. So now there is another question. Could we recalculate the risk on the basis of the first trimester risk? Would it take in consideration the use of aspirin? Yes, very good question. Aspirin, in the trial, we found that the incidence of term preeclampsia was not affected by aspirin. But that doesn't sound very intelligent. I cannot possibly believe that aspirin knows to have an effect on the development of preeclampsia at 36 weeks and six days, but the next morning you wake up and it has no effect. It is very unlikely that that would be the case. What is much more likely, and you have written a paper about that, is the shift hypothesis. And what is this shift hypothesis? That aspirin actually does have an effect in reducing the rate of term preeclampsia, but what it does do is that it doesn't eliminate preterm preeclampsia, it just shifts the gestational age at which you will develop preeclampsia to the right. So a woman that was meant to develop preeclampsia at 32 weeks develops it now at 36 weeks. And the woman that would develop preeclampsia at 34 weeks develops it at 38 weeks. A woman that would have developed preeclampsia at 38 weeks is actually prevented from delivering preeclampsia, but the prevention of the 38-week uh, predisposed preeclampsia is replaced by the one that would have developed at 34 weeks that is now developing it at 38. So I think that this shift hypothesis makes sense. But the consequence of it all is that the overall incidence of term preeclampsia remains the same. I still believe that women should have screening in the first trimester and effective street treatment with aspirin at the minimum of 100 milligrams per day from 32 to 36 weeks. And then in addition to that, have the screening at 36 weeks for the incidence of term preclamps. Thank you. So I have another question. Many clinicians would be reluctant to advance the time of delivery without a multi-center clinical trial. Are you going to launch such a trial? The trial is starting next week, and I hope that we will complete it in one year. And I think that it is better, like everything, to wait for the results of such a trial, however rational uh, the argument is based on this slide, uh, to wait for the results of the trial. I do not want us to engage in a process where we produce more harm than good. It is potentially possible that by inducing women early at 37 and 38 weeks, uh, contrary to the study from Grobman, that we will increase the rate of cesarean section. It is possible that we, we will increase neonatal unit admission and uh, neonatal morbidity. So I think it is only fair that we have the results of a trial before we have clinical implementation. I have another question. It is in Spanish, but I will try to translate. So the question is, for the women that are stratified as high risk in first trimester, would you repeat the screening in second and third trimester? Yes, definitely. The, the first trimester screening by the combination of uh, uterine MAP and PLGF is effective for the prediction of preterm preeclampsia is not effective for the prediction of term preeclampsia, number one. Number two, with first trimester screening for preeclampsia, we identify about 75% of preterm preeclampsia and only about 40% of term preeclampsia. So in, in an ideal world, we should also continue to screen in the second trimester visit to identify the 75% of women that will develop preterm preeclampsia that we failed to identify in the first trimester. So the answer is yes. I have seen also one of the questions there, the question about PABE. We are already using PABE for screening in the first trimester for Down syndrome. 
Should you not just utilize, utilize Pabay? Do we really need to use PLGF? And let me make it abundantly clear that Pabay is a very, very poor replacement of biochemical testing in the first trimester for preeclampsia. Pabay is very poor and it's only useful as a predictor if you don't measure uterine artery. It's only in combination of mean arterial pressure in Pabay that you gain some value in screening for preterm preeclampsia. Once you use uterine artery as well, Pabay doesn't add anything. And PLGF is a lot, a lot, a lot more effective than Pabay in first trimester screening for preterm preeclampsia. Okay, thank you. And uh, now the next question. Um, do you see a role for calcium in preeclampsia prevention? If so, when should we, you recommend to start it during pregnancy? You mean, you mean aspirin? Sorry. For, the question is re in relation to aspirin in the first trimester. Is that, is that what you meant? Uh, calcium, calcium, sorry. Ah, calcium, wow, yeah. Okay, I haven't, I haven't discussed calcium. Let me tell you the story of calcium, because it's very interesting. In countries that are calcium deficient, there is a reduction in the rate of preeclampsia by 50%, both preterm and term preeclampsia, if we look at the studies overall, by giving calcium supplementation. The real, and, and, and in studies in countries that are not calcium deficient, Calcium was not useful in preventing preeclampsia. But you know, this is a, a bit of a, a strange way of thinking at, uh, at things. It's not the country that is calcium deficient, but it's the people within a country. So the question is, are people in developed countries calcium deficient? And what proportion of them are calcium deficient, especially the middle classes now that don't like to drink milk, but to have all sorts of strange um, replacements of milk, potato-based uh, replacement of, uh, of, of, of milk. We wanted to address that question, and we have carried out a study that is ongoing in our hospital, where we are using a, a, an application called 24 Intake, which asks you a lot of questions about what you ate the day before and what do you eat in one of the weekend days. And on the basis of that, you calculate your calcium uh, intake. We have assessed the first 1,500 patients from this study, and I was shocked to find out that certainly in our uh, hospital, which is in a poor area of London, 55% um, of women had a calcium intake less than 700 milligrams per day, which is the level considered to be uh, inadequate calcium intake. So unfortunately, there is no simple way of taking a blood sample to measure your calcium uh, level, and you need to rely on these sort of calcium uh, intake uh, questionnaires. Um, therefore, I think that we have to develop a method, a simplified method, of identifying the women in developed countries that are calcium uh, deficient. And the striking number for me, that maybe more than half of the women in developed countries, certainly like in England, are calcium deficient, should stimulate research to identify a group of women that could benefit from a simple intervention of calcium supplementation for the prevention reduction of the rate of both preterm and term uh, preeclampsia. Okay. So I think we have time for one more question. There is one question. Um, do you propose to adjust the levels of both biomarkers for each ethnic, etnia, as you demonstrated in the black woman? 150%. Let me repeat. A policy that does not adjust for race is racist and is prejudicial against black women and also, to a certain extent, South Asian women. 
the very groups that have the highest risk of developing preeclampsia have naturally a higher level of PLGF. And therefore, if we don't adjust for that effect, as I have shown, we are misclassifying a black woman that is at high risk of preeclampsia by telling them, look, your level of PLGF is, is normal. Well, it's normal by white standards, but it is low by black standards. We must adjust in screening for downs, in screening for preeclampsia, in screening for anything. When we do biochemical testing, we must adjust for the gestational age, for the weight of the woman, for the race of the, or, 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 of the woman, for the method of conception, and so on, to get the values in a fair way converted into multiples of the media. 100%. One last I can question, see questions just to close. about the cost. Uh, yeah. I believe that all women should have PLGF and, and, and fleet assessment in the third trimester and also perhaps in the second trimester. Yes, at the moment, the cost is quite high, but the companies have invested a lot of money for the development of these biomarkers and until there is a high uptake by the whole population, then the prices will remain high. I am 100% certain that over the next two, three, four, five years, there will be routine assessment of the whole population by these biomarkers, and therefore the prices will dramatically decrease. Okay, and to finish, let's try to answer this question. How about international guidelines for preeclampsia on PLGF and SFLIT? There are guidelines, uh, there are FIGO uh, guidelines, for example, that have accepted, number one, that we should have first semester combined screening, essentially using the Pyramid Foundation algorithm for preterm preeclampsia and treatment with the appropriate dose of, uh, of aspirin. And they have also acknowledged the importance of the measurement of fleet and PLGF. What they have not done is, because they're still, the, the, the main proponents of PLGF in England, the fleet PLGF uh, ratio from uh, Varlochen, for example, good friends of mine, um, they are still at the level of saying, well, let's just do the, the concentrations and the concentration ratios. And in each meeting that we meet, I disagree, and I advocate the rationale that, like everything else, we must take into account the prior risk and also include the measurement of blood pressure in the calculation of risk. Uh, and, and, and I am sure that I am right. Thank you, Professor. It was a pleasure. Uh, I know many people asked. We will send out the link of the recording so you can go back to this great lecture. And I will close the session now. Thank you very much, Professor. Once Can I, more. before you finish, I, I am seeing in front sure. of me the question about the Congo Red. We have carried out extensive research on this. It was very, very promising, and it is very simple uh, to do. Unfortunately, we found it not to be useful at all. The Congo Red is not useful in the prediction of preeclampsia. PLGF and fleet are, and, pressure, and blood pressure is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to the audience. Thank you. We will close the session.